Hello. Welcome back to my Sleepy Time Reading Channel. I'm so glad you're here. I'm sorry I missed my posting time yesterday. I didn't think I was going to be able to do it because we're getting ready to move and we closed on our house on Monday and things have been a little crazy. But I did find time to sit down and record yesterday and I read the whole set of articles that I'm going to read for today only to discover that I hadn't plugged my microphone in. So it was a terrible recording only using the built-in microphone on my laptop. So that kind of sucked and it discouraged me and I put it away for the night. But I'm back today and going to get back on track with this. Good Housekeeping from May 1888. Today we're going to be taking a look at some desserts and some fruit preserving and canning. Starting with Dainties in the Dining Room, Cream Desserts. A home should never be considered entirely furnished in its culinary department, unless equipped with an ice cream freezer, as with it many attractive and nutritious desserts may be prepared with but little trouble and expense. It matters not how heartily one may have dined, a dish of good ice cream is always acceptable. Being light and easy of digestion, it has in a great measure in our home taken the place of puddings and pies. We consider it fully as well adapted for winter use as for summer, because in warm weather, if taken in large quantities, it often cools the system too rapidly, while in the winter season, the system is in a more vigorous condition and naturally withstands what would be a severe shock if one was enervated by the warm weather. Every housekeeper, especially those who have children in their families, should study to provide what will please and also nourish the little ones an ice cream we know to be nutritious, while it never fails to please them. It is a very common occurrence to hear a physician speak of the injurious effects of ice cream, and at the same time admit that they result from the coloring and flavoring extracts used in them. A homemade strawberry ice cream will have a delicate pink color, and will not be a bright pink as we see it when served at the restaurant. The true tint is modest as the berry which produces it. I use natural flavors altogether, filling a number of pint glass jars during the summer with pineapple, strawberries, and peaches, especially for the purpose of flavoring our ices. Such flavoring will have no pernicious effect on the most delicate stomach of invalid or children, but provides a delicious savor which is grateful to all. Never put ice cream into the freezer until time for freezing, as the vegetable acid of the fruit will attack the tin and impair the flavor and in some instances form injurious compounds, but this will not occur after the cream is frozen. The most delicious ice cream is made by freezing plain cream, sweetened and flavored, and is simply true to its name. But for the benefit of those who do not have a large supply of cream, I repeat, with a slight variation, Miss Parloa's excellent rule. One pint of milk, one cupful of sugar, one tablespoonful of flour, one saltspoonful of salt, two eggs, one pint of cream, and flavoring. Put the milk on the stove in a double boiler. Mix the sugar, flour, salt, and the yolks of eggs together. Add this to the boiling milk and return it to the boiler again and cook 20 minutes. When ready to freeze, add the beaten whites of the eggs, cream, and flavoring. If you have more cream, add more sugar to make it quite sweet, remembering that both sweetness and flavor are diminished by freezing. This makes a delicious, smooth cream, which if cooked fully 20 minutes will have no taste of the flour. Never use cornstarch or many eggs, as frozen custard is a very poor substitute for ice cream. With this rule as a foundation, a vast variety of choice desserts may be made, adding to this the syrup taken from a pint of canned strawberries or pineapple produces a cream which far surpasses anything flavored with extracts. One cupful of java coffee added, made with one heaping tablespoonful of coffee and one cupful of boiling water, makes a cream which all lovers of coffee pronounce most excellent. The children at our home are always delighted with coffee ice cream. It indulges a taste which we have not as yet allowed them to gratify by drinking coffee. Another favorite ice cream is made by beating chocolate or fine cocoa with the eggs, flour, and sugar, then adding a little vanilla. The blending of chocolate and vanilla gives a delicate effect which is far beyond the flavor of chocolate alone. 
To my taste, and also to most of our friends who dine at our table, the cream prepared with the candied fruits surpasses in delicacy anything of the kind that can be made. One half pound of candied apricots, cherries, and pineapple, cut fine and soaked in about two tablespoons full of sherry wine, and added to any plain cream, makes, when served with sponge cake, a dessert which even the temperance advocate cannot refuse, while the natural peach blow tint from the cherries gives it a very pretty effect. Although strongly opposed to the use of wine as a beverage, I do not hesitate to state that in connection with this fruit nothing will take the place of a little sherry wine, for the fruit in itself adds no flavor to the cream, while the sherry seems to draw out the flavor and prevents the fruit from freezing solid and chilling the teeth, as in the case of canned fruits, where we can only use the syrup for such purposes. The writer once attended a dinner where two of the guests were severely opposed to the use of wine for any purpose, and would positively refuse to partake of anything flavored therewith. Out of respect to them, this fruit cream was served flavored with vanilla. There was a desire for a few drops of sherry by the less scrupulous guests, who were aware that this would have provided the one thing needful to make the most attractive of desserts. I do not by any means condemn the use of vanilla for cooking purposes. In the season of strawberries, nothing is so acceptable with that fruit as vanilla ice cream, as it seems to be the only flavor which blends into perfect harmony with that of the strawberry. The vanilla bean imparts a finer flavor than any of the extracts used for such purposes. Vanilla ice cream served with strawberries makes a far more appetizing dessert than the best dish of strawberry ice cream. Sponge cake should always be served with ice cream as it is not sweet enough to detract from the cream, nor is it flavored too pronounced, or is it too rich in accompaniment. If other cakes are served, never, under any circumstances, omit the sponge cake. A large variety of delicious and attractive desserts may be made from whipped cream. Charlotte Russe seldom if ever fails to please, and like ice cream is an excellent substitute and far more wholesome than puddings and pies, although not so light and easy of digestion as ice cream for unless the cream is of good consistency it will not whip. Neither must it be too thick, or the result will be the same. The cream must be fully twenty-four hours old before it is whipped, and if slightly sour, will whip fully as well. Nothing short of a cookbook could give the full variety of methods of serving whipped cream, but I will here give a few for the benefit of those who are not in the habit of making desserts of cream, and who have not had the opportunity of attending a cooking school. Line tea or coffee cups, or the thick paper cups made for the purpose, with sponge cake cut very thin, lining the sides only. Fill with the whipped cream, sweetened and flavored, and keep on ice until ready to serve. Charlotte Russe can be made either with or without gelatine, but unless wine is used for flavoring, I would not advise the use of gelatine as it requires a strong flavoring to counteract the taste where it is not used in connection with lemon. One pint of cream will nearly triple in whipping, hence it is a very economical dessert. The first and most essential thing is to have the cream and utensils very cold. Pour the cream into a deep bowl which is set into a pan of pounded ice. Place a whipped churn in the cream, tipping a little to one side, thus allowing the cream to rush in and out freely. Work the dasher up and down until the bowl is very full. The first bubbles will be large and will not remain firm, therefore stir them down with a spoon and whip again. I think cream whips better where none of the froth is removed until nearly all is whipped, although there are a variety of opinions on this subject, but in no case should the froth be removed below the perforations in the cylinder. Take off the froth with a spoon and put it in a granite pan on ice, and it will be found that a portion of the cream will not whip. Take this and heat it with one-third cupful of fine sugar. Pour it on one-fourth box of gelatine which has been soaked fifteen minutes in cold water. Stir until it begins to thicken. Flavor and strain into the whipped cream, then add the whites of two eggs well beaten. Fill the molds with this, and keep on ice until ready to serve. If whipped cream is to be served as a garnish, it is much more delicate, and also more easily prepared with the eggs and without the gelatine but if it is to be molded, the gelatine forms an essential part. One of the most delicious methods of serving strawberries is with gelatine and whipped cream. 
The directions for making plain jelly accompany each box of gelatine. When the jelly is made but not stiffened, pour a portion of it into a deep smooth bowl with a few berries. Place this on ice, and when it is hard, pour in more liquid and berries, place on ice, and proceed as before until all the jelly is used. Cooling by layers is the only way in which the fruit will be distributed evenly throughout the whole mass. Any fruit may be used in this way. When ready to serve, turn out on a platter and garnish with whipped cream, with vanilla for flavoring. This makes not only a palatable, but a very ornamental dessert. The pleasant remembrance of a dinner is like that of many other enjoyments, in great measure due to the finale. As Shakespeare said, the setting sun and music at the close, as the last taste of sweets is sweetest last. Fruit Canning and Preserving the new way and the old. One housekeeper's experience. The canning of fruit has so done away with the old method of making preserves that the latter is almost a lost art, and anything on the subject may be new to many readers and possibly interesting, especially as there seems to be a tendency of late to return to the old way. There is certainly a deliciousness about preserves that is not found in canned fruit, and if they are used moderately, they are probably not harmful. They cannot be eaten as freely as either fruit canned or in its natural state, but a taste of preserves with good bread and butter makes a satisfactory tea, and they are also very pleasant when used instead of sauce with puddings and custards. If a prudent housewife hesitates to make them on the score of economy, let her consider that the smaller amount used will make them in the end cost less than canned fruit. A family of moderate size will use a quart of berries canned at one meal, while a quart of jam will suffice for two or three, and after all the difference in expense is slight, as it is only an addition of the price of half a pound of sugar to every pound of fruit. The old rule of pound for pound is the surest method of success with preserves, a pound of sugar to a pound of fruit. And another very important matter is to have good fruit. It pays to use the best and is labor thrown away to preserve fruit that is in the slightest degree fermented. Many persons buy pineapples when a little specked for the sake of economy or because they think them riper than the sound ones. There is no economy in this, for in the first place one can never tell where the speck will end. It may be very small on the surface, but extend through half the pineapple inside. And beside this, even when great care is taken to remove the decayed portion, a taint of fermentation may remain, which will ruin all the rest. There is nothing more delicious than pineapples when nicely preserved. They are not good when sliced, for then the tough core remains, and it is hard to eat them without awkwardness. The best way is to scrape them with a fork. It requires patience to do them, for they are of all fruit the worst to handle, and when many are done at a time, one's hands are apt to be skinned by the acid of the rind. A good way to treat them is to wrap a cloth about the top and hold it firmly with the left hand, the fruit resting on a table. Then, with a sharp knife, cut down the rind as thinly as possible, leaving the eyes in. After all are peeled, take a penknife and cut out the eyes one by one. Then, holding the fruit by the tops, scrape down with a silver fork till nothing is left but the core. Weigh the pineapple and put it with the same amount of sugar over the fire. Use a porcelain or granite kettle and silver spoon so as not to discolor the fruit. Let it boil up, and as soon as the fruit becomes transparent, it is done. It may be put away in glass jars or jelly glasses. It will keep, usually without trouble, even when exposed to the air. Pineapples are about the first fruit to be put up, though strawberries soon follow if they do not precede them. There are various methods of preserving strawberries. A very satisfactory one for keeping both color and flavor is to scald the berries and sugar pound for pound till they boil up once. Then remove them very quickly from the fire and pour them out on platters so that there is very little depth to them. Place them where the sun will shine on them and leave them for one day. If the syrup is not thick by that time, let them stand another day. After this, put them cold into glass jars or jelly glasses. If they are set out of doors in the sun, they should be covered with netting to keep off insects. A good way is to make bags of netting and draw them up over the platters so that nothing can get in from underneath. 
but if convenient, it is safer to place them before a window in the house, where the sun will shine fully upon them for several hours at least. All fruits are liable to mold when exposed to dampness, and those in glasses should always be covered with brandy papers. Whiskey or alcohol will do, or the paper may be wet with white of egg or butter. Press the paper on the fruit or jelly so that no air can remain underneath. Then, if there is any mold, it can easily be removed with the paper. Another housekeeper's experience. Now that the fruit canning season is upon us again, it may be welcome to some of the amateur housekeepers who seem to derive great benefit from the practical suggestions given in good housekeeping by veteran housekeepers to receive instruction in the minute details of canning from one of many years' experience. These small details may seem to the proficient cook rather tedious and unnecessary, but I can glance retrospectively at a period in my life when I was so ignorant on the subject that just such an exact and well-tried rules would have been an indescribable help and comfort to me. I have not noticed that any directions touch upon the fact that many jars, even new ones, are imperfect, and in order to ensure the entire exclusion of air, on which success depends, must be tested before using. I never place fruit in either old or new jars without first pouring a little water in each jar, screwing down the lid, and turning it upside down to see if a drop oozed through. After a thorough wiping, if the least moisture be visible, it will be dangerous to use the jar. Sometimes another top or an additional rubber may render it watertight. Be sure to use the same lid as that with which the jar was tested. The first fruits for canning are cherries, although some put up strawberries in this way. I have tried the latter and found them very unsatisfactory, being flat and insipid. The sour pie cherry, the mayduke, and the white ox heart are all excellent. I stone the white ones, but like the flavor of the others much better with the stones left in them. Wash and stem the berries, weigh a quarter pound of sugar to each pound of fruit, and pour on a very small quantity of water, just sufficient to moisten the sugar, until the fruit softens. Boil rapidly, and only until the cherries begin to shrivel and break. Have the jars lying in very warm water, and a towel in a pan of cold water alongside. Wring the towel out of the cold water, wrap it tightly around the jar, covering every part, pour in the boiling fruit, and screw down the lid. Keep in a dark closet in the cellar, and when, in the depths of next winter, you produce a delicious cherry pie or a dish of cherry tapioca, the family will be amazed and curious to know where you found fresh cherries at that time of year. Gooseberries that are nearly ripe and rhubarb done in the same way are both very good. Blackberries, huckleberries, and green gauges are all cooked with the same proportion of sugar and put in the jars boiling hot. The large, cultivated blackberry is much better for canning than that growing wild. Blackberries must not do much more than boil up once or twice and should be taken up when almost solid. They will then retain a rich, spicy flavor, which is destroyed by much cooking. Plums should be cooked somewhat longer until they are mashed and soft. They will not look so well, but will taste better. Pineapples, peaches, Bartlett pears, and crab apples are placed in the jars cold and raw, and a syrup poured over them. Before preparing the fruit, make the syrup in proportion of three quarters of a pound of sugar to a pint of water. Boil five minutes and set away to cool. Pare your pineapples and take out the dark seeds. Then cut into slices about half an inch thick and afterward into dice. Pack tightly into the jars and pour the syrup over them cold. Place in a boiler of cold water up to the necks with the lid lying loosely on over a good, solid, and very hot fire. Let it come to a boil and boil five minutes, then seal. I use the early sweet peaches with pink cheeks, also the Morris whites. Pair and put them in whole. Pair Bartlett pears, half and pack tightly. Do the Siberian crab apples in the same way. Now I come to a little matter which I have wished to tell the readers of good housekeeping for a long time. I possess a wonderful little contrivance for placing the jars in, to prevent their tipping over, and to render the handling of them easy, which I can neither see in any store nor hear of in kitchens of my friends. My husband picked up a dozen of them so long ago that we cannot remember where he bought them. It is simply a stand formed of two half-inch strips of tin crossed and riveted flatly together. 
then each of the four ends is turned up about three inches and riveted to a circular band that surrounds the jar. A high wire handle is fastened to this by rivets. The jar rests firmly in this stand and does not sway about or upset in the water and cannot touch the others. The wire handle enables one to lift them out of the hot water without the risk of coming into contact with it. If I have not succeeded in describing it plainly enough, I will be glad to send a drawing of it to anyone desiring it. I think any tinsmith could make them. No canner should be without them, and my poor old rusty dozen have almost robbed canning of its terrors. I put up over a hundred jars of the fruits I have mentioned last year, and I had but two spoil. One very important item is not to cook the fruit too much, and I seldom taste canned fruit that retains its flavor as well as my own, done as I have directed. Those are really good instructions. I almost feel like I could follow them and can some fruit myself, although I've never tried canning, so I wouldn't necessarily know. And I love the way she describes that little holder for the jars that her husband got her and tells you to go get one made for yourself at the nearest tinsmith. And I like that she was willing to mail out a drawing of it to anyone who was interested. But I think she did a good job of describing it. I could visualize it pretty well. So that's it for Good Housekeeping this time. I'll be back very soon, and we'll be back to history with more from the Elizabethan Sea Dogs. In the meantime, thank you as always for joining me on my Sleepy Time Reading channel. If you like what I'm doing, please do hit that like button and subscribe if you want to keep coming back and hearing more of my reading. If you have any comments, suggestions, things you'd like to hear me read in the future, leave a comment, let me know, and I will be back soon with more sleepy time reading. Till then, bye-bye.